That was David Bowie with TVC15 from his 1976 album Station to Station, recorded around the time he was filming The Man Who Fell to Earth, opposite our guest today, actress Candy Clark, best known for roles in films like American Graffiti, The Big Sleep with Robert Mitchum, Fat City with Jeff Bridges, and more. Candy Clark, welcome to the show. Thank you. You know, you've been on my mind lately because I recently went to see the new documentary about David Bowie called Moon Age Daydream. Did you? I haven't seen it. You haven't? Nope, I haven't. Oh. I have not seen it. Because but I will. I promise. <laughs> there are clips of the man who fell to earth sprinkled liberally through that um, film. <laughs> I would expect so. Yeah. And I'm calling it a documentary. That's really not fair. It's more of a kaleidoscopic film essay that tries to capture everything there was about David Bowie. And he's such a fascinating character. When you were working on the film, did you come into that as someone who was familiar with his music, like a big fan of his? I was not a real fan. I hadn't seen him in concert. I had seen him in that film that he did, a documentary, Mm -hmm. where he was in that knit suit with one leg exposed and one leg in a, like a sweater, <laughs> a sweater jumpsuit kind of thing. And I just had, I was living in New York and I just happened to catch that movie. And that was about all I knew about him. Uh, when he was cast as the Thomas Jerome Newton, you know, he was just another actor to me. And that was a good thing because after the film was done, I got some tickets to go see him in concert as the thin white Duke. And I was like immediately like a groupie and all gaga. And I, <laughs> I really couldn't talk to him anymore. You know, I was like way too impressed. And so that was a good thing that I hadn't really done much background or seen him in concert prior because it really would have affected the performance. And as, as it was, you know, I really, my character really manhandled him a lot in the movie and pulled his hair and scratched his shoulder and right. twisted his nipples and stuff like that. And, you know, but I would have been way more reluctant <laughs> if I'd have seen him in concert. So, <laughs> now when you, you understand, of right? Of course, of course, sure. <laughs> you, you know, he's larger than life on stage, but he went on to do many more films after that. So he wasn't just a, a rock star who was doing this as like a little vacation project. I mean, he he took movie making and acting very seriously. No, he he was very talented in every way you can imagine. Art. He was a voracious reader. He was a thinker. He was, you know, he was just so many talents, so many talents, besides having great beauty, you know, with bone structure and ha thick hair mm -hmm. and just, you know, a very handsome man and very sweet and nice and very down to earth. No pun intended. So... I want to go back to the very beginning. When you were a, a young girl, did you have aspirations to be in the movies? You go to the movies and you look on the big screen and say, that's for me? Not at all. My aspiration, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas. We were uh, probably from the wrong side of the tracks, you could say, and poor. Um, my aspiration was to be a secretary receptionist. And I did that for a while with a dictaphone, you know, that, <laughs> and, and I took shorthand in high school, but I never could get the knack of that. All I can remember is the symbol for dear sir, and that's it. But thanks to the dictaphone, I would put the little earpieces in my ears and then type, you know, it was uh, said out loud and you just type from that. But that was my aspiration to be a secretary receptionist, front desk, you know, and you know, that was a good position for someone from Fort Worth at the time. So how do we go from the dictaphone to appearing in your first film, which was directed by John Huston? Uh, well, I had moved. My friend and I, Judy and I, were. we had worked at the Dallas Apparel Mart as uh, models. You know, Dallas Apparel Mart has, brings in people from all over the country to show their wares, their clothing lines and it's all little cubicles where 
they bring in their stuff and then they hire local models to come out to the different department stores that are sitting there looking at the different lines. And my friend Judy and I did that and it was really fun. And, uh, the man we worked for said, Oh yeah, if you're ever in New York, look me up. And he gave us a card. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what you don't say to two teenagers, you know, right. <laughs> that are suffocating in Fort Worth, Texas, because there's nothing going on. And uh, my friend Judy and I, we started planning. Okay, we're going to New York, and we're going to look him up. <laughs> and uh, the night we were leaving, or the day we were leaving, we had youth fair tickets, and I spent forty bucks on a one-way ticket. And so did Judy, but uh, she just disappeared. We were supposed to, you know, be on the road, and you couldn't find her. Turned out she had been arrested for shoplifting. Oh. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to go by myself. And I got on the plane, the midnight flight, and uh, as I was coming down on the airplane, and we were starting to land, it was dawn. And I looked out at New York City and all those buildings, and it was kind of this pink light all over it, pink and gold. And I thought, I'm never going back to Texas. And I just moved to New York from the air. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's just like no more small town mentality, no more small town. I I want to be in the big city. And I couch surfed back then. It was the early 70s, and it was, you know, a lot of people just invited strangers into their home. Yeah, well, it's not really a home. It's an apartment. New York's all about apartments. Right. And couch surf, but it was the 70s, you know. It was a different era. You wouldn't do that today. People would hitchhike, you know. It was a safer era. And eventually I got my own apartment, and I started in the modeling world. And from the modeling world, I had heard about being an extra in movies. And I thought, that sounds fun. And I uh, was an extra, along with like 200 people, in this scene in a movie called, a Dustin Hoffman movie, called Who is Harry Kellerman? And why is he saying these things about me? And that was a very long title. <laughs> and I loved it. I loved it. I thought, this is fun. You're you know, hanging out with a bunch of extras. And, you know, the, there was, you know, a table full of donuts and coffee and stuff. And I thought, this is great. And it was like $40 a day. And that was like, hmm, okay. <laughs> and so I went back to the casting person office that had gotten me that extra job and I had my picture and I said I want to do more extra work and this casting man from LA was standing right next to him and his name was Fred Roos and he said hey I'm going to go out to Queens and he was casting the Godfather and so (laughs) he said you want to come and watch him do the casting of the Godfather and I'm like sure (laughs) <laughs> and you know, I just walk off with strangers back then. That's how everybody was, you know. There was really no fear of serial killers or right. Jeffrey Dahmer or any of these people, you know. It was just a safe time. And uh, I met Francis Coppola. I watched Jimmy Kahn do his screen test. And, you know, I did a little screen test with Francis Coppola directing. And, you know, I went back several days in a row and from there Fred Roos wanted me to come out and try out for the John Huston film called Fat City and I struggled against that I said I just want to be an extra I don't want to do any of that I don't want to you know like my modeling world and all of that but he wore me down I came out and tried out for the part and uh, I got it (laughs) Wow. You know, anyone... I know it sounds unreal, but, you know, things just kind of fell into place. I'm with, I was waiting for you to say, and then I ran off with Chaplin, you know. I mean, where, 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 what else could come after <laughs> I mean, that? I mean, it was just like, <laughs> you know, just things fell into place. Happy birthday! That was a scene from the movie American Graffiti featuring our guest today, 
Candy Clark. You know, the funny thing is that film came out in 1972 and it was only looking back 10 years to 1962. But by 1972, 62 seemed like a million years ago. Back it then. was yeah. because times had changed so drastically. The music had changed. The attitudes had changed. The music so drastically changed from the 60s to the 70s with the you know, the doo-wop all the way to the Rolling Stones, and it got a lot darker, and, you know, it just, it just the whole style of, of dress and everything, cars, remember the Pinto? <laughs> yeah. Well, what I like about that movie, I mean, there's so much to like about it, but I always get the sense that here you are, a group of young actors, and you're obviously working really hard, but it seemed as if it was just as much fun to shoot as it is for everybody to watch. And I, I suspect that for the actors in the movie, it was kind of like reliving the last summer of their high school days, too. You were reliving it. We were just doing the acting job. <laughs> <laughs> we were just a bunch of actors on a low-budget film. And it was very, very, we shot it up in Petaluma, and it was very foggy and cold, and it was like 40 degrees at night when we were working, and the film is mostly shot at night, so it was very chilly, and, uh, you know, there were no chairs, there was a dressing room, hair room, and makeup department all in one trailer, I mean, it was super low budget, and the cars were pretty much non-functional and had to be, like, towed around. And <laughs> and I picked that little spaghetti strap dress because when I lived in Fort Worth, I really wanted a spaghetti strap dress, but, you know, we couldn't afford it, and I wanted a pair of Capizio. So they found me all of these things that I had lusted after, as a teenager, and uh, yeah, I had on these really funky Capizio shoes that have been so worn by the previous owner. Most of our clothes are actually, most, a Toad's shirt, I think, was custom made, but the rest of them were from the second-hand store. The clothing was all used clothing, huh. and um, yeah, there were, it was a no frills, it really was. Well, it launched that nostalgia craze of the 1970s, and from American Graffiti, we got Happy Days and Grease. Definitely, yeah. yes. And I'm so happy and grateful to be in it, because to this day, uh, it's the 50th anniversary since we shot the film, and next year is the 50th anniversary since we released the film. And it is as big now as it was then. And people, I met Jeff Beck, the uh, guitarist, mm -hmm. uh, the, and he, I met him at a hot rod show because I've done a, quite a few hot rod shows where I sign autographs. Anyway, he comes up to the booth and he's, he picks out a picture and I sign it. And I said, well, I've, I'm waiting. And I say, so who do I write this to? And he said, to Jeff Beck, and I looked up, and i like, the Jeff Beck? And he said, yes. And so I said, I've got to have a selfie with you. And I tell you, he is such a fan. He was shaking, tremoring <laughs> from excitement to be with one of the characters from the movie, his favorite movie. He told me he had seen it 3,000 times. I'm like, Really, he said, because he recreated the car, so he would watch it over and over and look for all the specifics of the yellow 32, and he's a super fan, and yeah. Wow. So because of that, I've had a few backstage passes and tickets to go see him, but yeah. Well, so you were, you were like his David Bowie. Yes. Yeah, he, he was, was excited like, to know, meet you. you know, he was just shaking. <laughs> And I said, this really should be the other way around. I should be shaking, and you should be calm. <laughs> but, yeah, really, really. It's led me to some interesting people and led me to interesting, you know, trips to hot rod shows, and it's, it's wonderful. You know, I could sit here and, and talk to you all afternoon about um, 
all, all your your various film projects, but I, I, I'm going to uh, run out of You're time. You're out of time. I, I know. get the hint. But, however, <laughs> yes. I can't yes. let you go without mentioning your involvement in, boy, I don't want to call it a TV series. I suppose it's more of a TV phenomenon slash franchise, Twin Peaks. Oh, yeah. I um, had a little part in that, and that was fun. Well, Played the sheriff's wife. Did you know that there is a Twin Peaks wiki on the internet? So your character, which was Doris, Doris. has a whole biography. <laughs> I don't know if you if you knew about this. Send me the link. I want to read my biography because right. I had I had ideas about Doris. And I, if the series had gone on, I wanted to talk to one of the writers, and we go to Doris's house, and sure enough, everything she describes is happening. The leak, <laughs> the diarrhea, uh, you know, the dog in the cabinet. And I really wanted to see, and the Volkswagen that doesn't run, you know, her father, uh, as Volkswagen lurched and lurched, you know, and... <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! But I, I wanted to prove to the audience that Doris wasn't crazy. She was just at the end of her rope with all these problems that never get solved. You know the leaks, and he says, "Can you get a bigger bucket?" I'm like, "Can I?" You know. <laughs> Did you enjoy working with David Lynch? It was real super easy. Yeah, it was real super easy, and. uh you know, he. We did one rehearsal where I came in like that crazy character, and he thought it was great. Let's shoot it. <laughs> no adjustments. And you know, I've read some of the re reviews where they say, "Oh, she really overacted." But you know, if you were in that situation and you had nagged and nagged and nagged to get leaks fixed, to get your dad's car fixed. And nothing ever gets done, and it's like the thousandth time that you've had to bring this up. How would you be talking? <laughs> exactly. Well, according to your to your character's bio, you moved with um, your husband to his hometown, so you're you're like a fish out of water. So you're probably your character probably not happy to be there anyway. No, and. Who want you know? That's the kind of town I left to go to New York City. Right. Okay. You know, she probably met him at some. She was on a vacation to Twin Peaks to visit, you know, a relative, and she ran into him. It was love at first sight. Next thing, though, she, she knows she's moving there, and it's just not panning out. And it turns out he never gets anything done. You know. Right. He's too lackadaisical and too mild mannered, and she's stuck with a flooded house, a dog with diarrhea, and you know a car that won't run. She needs to get out of there. Yeah, absolutely. She needs to go to yeah. New York on a pilgrimage. Yeah, get back right? to New York where <laughs> where things are better. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show, and I hope we can do it again sometime. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye.